a man sobs, a courtroom hears of a woman's death. It has been a long and arduous trial. With a hand or an arm over your mouth, there ain't gonna be any screaming. Rod Kovlin and Shelly Danishevsky had been married for 10 years when in 2009, he found her dead in the bath. And 911 gets a call from Rod Kovlin. My daughter just showed up. My little nine-year-old daughter just found her mother in the bathroom dead. NYPD believed Rod's account that his wife had slipped in the bathtub. It seems that that whatever story Colvin told the police, they just took it at face value. But suspicions are raised that Shelley's death in Manhattan's Upper West Side could have been murder, and secret recordings of family arguments make it clear. Rod Kovlin cared more about getting hold of his dead wife's money than he ever did about their marriage. Did you steal from your children? You what? stole before! <laughs> You're stealing their college money. Was the sobbing husband in the courtroom actually a killer? A New York murder mystery unravels in the Manhattan Supreme Court. Your number 12 is that your verdict? Yeah. And so say you all? Nineteen ninety-eight, and Shelley Danishevsky was living in an apartment on the Upper West Side of Manhattan and enjoying a successful career looking after super-rich clients. Shelley Danishevsky is um, young and beautiful, smart, successful. She's from uh, a, an Orthodox Jewish family, a very loving and close-knit family. She has a beautiful apartment. Shelley is a financial services executive. She's a, a money manager, and she's done quite well. She makes a lot of money. In May that year, the successful banker met Rod Kovlin, 11 years her junior, at a Jewish singles night in the Hell's Kitchen neighborhood. Rod Kovlin is also um, from a Jewish family. He, a very loving, close-knit family as well. She was just ready. She was ready for a new life, to be committed to somebody, and to hopefully be loved by a man. They see each other, you know, it's like a, across the room, they're like magnets. And uh, immediately it's instant attraction and the two of them are just smitten with each other. Someone like Shelley with millions of dollars um, uh, to play with would have been, you know, a prize that if she had batted an eye at him, he wouldn't have been able to turn down. It's like sparks fly. She had amassed great wealth being a very successful banker. And in fact, by all intents and purposes, Rod was basically going to be her new trophy husband. And he seemed like he was after a sugar mama. Rod is so enamored with her. And he tells his parents, you know, you really have got to meet this girl. She's amazing. Unlike Shelley, Kovlin's career wasn't going well. He sort of drifted through life and looked for people to basically tack onto. He is um, uh, an out of work stockbroker. Dr. Judy Ho is a forensic psychiatrist. It's her job to analyze the minds of those who have committed crimes. He was basically this barnacle that would just tack himself to people who were more successful, more wealthy, more powerful than him, and then absorb their power for himself. Shelley's family certainly had misgivings, but the relationship moved on fast. Before long, um, Shelley's telling her sister, um, we're, going, we're going to elope, and her sister talks her out of it. Was Shelley's family right to mistrust Rod Coughlin? This is somebody who probably drifted throughout life and very consciously kept a distance from people, nor did he really desire deep relationships. But Shelley was in love. They date uh, for about six months, and then they get married. Less than two years later, with Shelley in her late 30s, the Kovlins have a daughter. The marriage appears settled, but behind closed doors, cracks in the relationship between Shelley and Rod were becoming obvious. With this particular relationship, it just seemed like he was insincere from the start. Early on, it was pretty likely the relationship was going to fail. Little by little, the relationship starts to have some problems. It starts going downhill. Rod probably had sniffed out that there's probably a part of Shelley that had a lot of self-doubt, even though she was so successful. With no career to speak of, 
He had wildly unrealistic ambitions to be a professional backgammon player. He uh, loves playing online backgammon. He's hoping to make a career of it. He's not quite good enough to do that. Even though he said that he wanted to be a backgammon player professionally, he lacked the discipline and the skill to do so. So there was no money in backgammon for Rod. Instead, according to members of his own family, he lived off his wife's money. And unfortunately had lost his job because he spent a little too much time playing backgammon online. With Shelley's money, perhaps. A fact which criminologist Brian Frederick suggests was irresistible to Kovlin. So there was a study at Harvard University that, that used magnetic resonance imaging to look at the brains of 50 inmates right, um, who had psychopathy. And they found that their brains were wired for short-term personal gratification. Gambling, drinking, satisfied those sort of short-term um, uh, impulses. Right? So it's not surprising that after six years of this seeking these short-term gratification mechanisms, um, that he would eventually fall to pot. Shelly's constantly compromising herself in this relationship with Rod. It's like the more the relationship goes on, the more she's compromising. Rod Kovlin's behavior may suggest he is a naive dreamer, but leading criminologists suggest something more sinister. He was exhibiting troublingly dangerous traits. So another trait of psychopaths would be this parasitic lifestyle, right? But also um, very unrealistic long-term goals. I mean, he wasn't good at backgammon, and he had this goal of becoming sort of this pro backgammon player. But Kovlin wasn't just sponging off his wife. He was cheating on her too, with dozens of women. Not a surprise to those who know about him. So there's considerable evidence suggesting that the dark triad traits, this would be narcissism, psychopathy, and Machiavellianism, um, are linked with sexual promiscuity. And there was worse to come for Shelley. Rod suggests that maybe they should have an open marriage. There are moments and situations where couples agree to an open relationship and it actually works out for them. It's definitely in the minority, but it has been done. Shelley's not real thrilled with that idea. She absolutely flatly rejects that. This is a very, very different situation. Shelley does not want an open relationship. This was not a mutual agreement. It's something that Rod wanted, just that he could feel better about himself when he has these affairs. Married for 10 years, by 2009 with a failed career choice behind him, a wife bankrolling him, and an outlandish quest for sex with other women revealed, Rod Kovlin was hardly proving perfect marriage material. But was this evidence of a weak man or a wicked man? This is somebody who was all about getting what's his and making his life as good as it can be without considering anybody else. Had he actually performed CPR, he wouldn't be dry. I mean, the story that he was given them uh, kind of defies logic. Rod is, um, he's continuing to, to sort of become more and more unhinged. Shelly was brutally murdered in the prime of her life. And we felt by joining the dots, it was not rocket science. Rod Kovlin won't take no for an answer after suggesting to his wife Shelley that their marriage should become an open one. Clearly Shelley was discontented by that. She probably felt like it was a huge blow that he would even propose this. But the fact that Rod did propose it means that he has no consequence about Shelley's feelings. He doesn't care how she feels. And it was really just a way for him to get something for himself. And of course, when Shelley didn't agree, he still did it anyway. But it doesn't stop Rod. Rod decides he wants to get out there. Rod Coblin began to take extramarital affairs to a new level. He starts just hooking up with women right and left. I mean, just seeing dozens and dozens of women at a time. Someone who is able to have multiple affairs with women obviously has something going on for himself. And she may have seen that in the beginning. And he may have um, kept that act up um, for a while because the stakes were so high. The fact that he didn't hide any of his affairs was just another way to say, I have power over you, you can't leave me, no one's gonna want you anyway, you're older than me, how are you gonna get somebody who's better than me? And this was just part of his narrative to keep Shelly in her place. At one point, he uh, contacts 40 women on Facebook in one day. So he's really getting around, uh, seeing a lot of women. He just took away her self-esteem in any way that he could. The marriage may have been volatile to say the least, but Shelley wanted another child. That's with the help uh, of a donor egg because Shelley was unable to get pregnant. 
He made her feel bad that they had to use an egg donor to be able to have a child. There was a disconnect between Rod, the apparent loser, and Shelley, a woman with a plan. It seemed that um, she was much more mature, you know, not just by age chronologically, but by ambition and um, professionalism, where he was sort of an underachiever and um, didn't seem to have a lot going on. There was a match there that just wasn't right. Just how dangerous could it get for Shelley and her two young children? With Coughlin, we're dealing with a textbook psychopath who displays some narcissistic personality traits as well. So he wouldn't take responsibility for his own actions. One night in 2009, Rod's casual infidelities finally break the marriage. The final straw is when Rod comes home about six o'clock in the morning one day, and he's reeking of another woman's perfume. One of the characteristics of psychopaths, right, is this inflated self-worth. Right. So coming home smelling of perfume, especially, I wouldn't be surprised if he, you know, if he made sure that he got perfume on his clothing so that Shelley could tell he'd been with someone else. She's had it. She's, it, you're out of here. Just, just get out. Faced with an instruction to leave the family home, Rod Kovlin also faced a far from gilded Manhattan future. He wanted to keep the pulse on the relationship. He wanted to make sure that he had his grip on Shelly, that even if Shelly was starting to fall out of love with him, that she wouldn't actually leave him because then he wouldn't be able to get access to her money and be able to live this lifestyle that he'd become accustomed to. So Kovlin persuaded Shelly to make a fateful decision. In the interest of keeping things as normal as possible for the two children, uh, he moves into an apartment across the hall. Even when she finally decides that she's going to leave him, she still allows him to stay across the way from her so that they can still have some kind of normalcy for their children. Rod Kovlin's new apartment was paid for with Shelley's money. Having him across the hall probably um, uh, addressed any guilt she might be having about throwing him out. Shelley's trying to keep things as normal as possible for these two young children they have. Although her intentions were well, um, for her children and having him near her children. I think being an enabler to someone who clearly um, lacked the ambition or desire to do anything on their own probably made the situation worse rather than better. It was a decision that would come back to haunt Shelley. Some people might, you know, scream, why didn't she, you know, put a greater distance between the two of them? Why was he living across the hall from her? I think Shelley's always wanted to do the right thing, and she would do anything to keep her children safe, even if her own relationship was failing and even if she was unhappy. Not only are we dealing with a psychopath, but this is an abusive power and control relationship, and he had Shelley trained very well. Shelley was determined to move on with her life. Her star is still rising, and she's, she's getting new clients, she's meeting new men. By contrast, her estranged husband was becoming increasingly bitter, vindictive. Rod is, um, he's becoming more and more combative. Uh, he's, his behavior is, is really kind of scary. This is somebody who is all about getting what's his and making his life as good as it can be without considering anybody else. He then begins to believe that she almost owes it to him now. Rod's behavior is erratic um, and threatening. And um, meanwhile, Shelley's trying to keep it together. In one sinister move, Kovlin enlisted the couple's toddler in mind games. He tries to coach their little two-year-old son uh, into saying that she's been abusing him, physically abusing the little boy. Coaching her son uh, to accuse Shelley of abuse was most likely his attempt at um, discrediting Shelley's character. Kovlin's twisted gambit didn't work. Well, that story it doesn't really hold any water. It just has nobody believes it. And in fact, it, it winds up backfiring on Rod. A family court judge saw straight through the subterfuge and punished Kovlin for the attempted deception. His visitation becomes more and more restricted so that now he can't visit the kids without having someone else present. The court order didn't stop Kovlin from abusing his visitation rights. At one point, Shelley gets really nervous when he, the kids don't return home from a visit. Uh, she gets hysterical. She calls and reports it. Rod Kovlin looked for more ways to get revenge on his wife. He starts hacking into Shelley's emails and her phone. Rod has actually installed um, a keyboard tracker on her computer. 
This was probably a way for him to keep tabs on her by hacking into her phone, her emails, um, so that he could be one step ahead of her. And things were about to get worse. In May 2009, things had gotten to the point where she was concerned for her own safety. He gets more and more menacing and even seems to sort of border on violence. Shelley claimed that Kovlin, a martial arts fan, had attacked her. Shelley actually confides in her doctor that Rod has tried to choke her. Kovlin grabbed Shelley in a martial arts hold and restricted her breathing. And tried to choke her out and said, I'm going to kill you. Where it's common that people tell people out of anger or whatever that they're going to kill someone, it becomes dangerous when that person is in a position where he has that person by the throat. It almost displays that they feel like they have the power and they want to show them that they have the power to kill. She's really, really getting nervous. She's telling her friends she really is afraid that he's going to be violent and that he could kill her. Increasingly worried about what Kovlin might do, Shelley took drastic action. All this whole time, Rod is, is sort of spiraling out of control. So Shelley's nervous, and she changes the locks on the apartment, uh, and she gets a protective order. That is probably the result of, of him frightening her to the point where she thought she was going to be physically harmed. Protection orders aren't easily given. There has to be some display or evidence of physical threat of violence or actual physical violence for it to happen. So somewhere along the line, uh, Rod displayed some sort of behavior or committed some act that would convince a judge that it was prudent to give a protection order. Rod is, um, he's continuing to, to sort of um, become more and more unhinged. In December 2009, Kovlin's hacking of Shelley's computer unearthed a devastating revelation. Shelley is, um, she's had it, and she emails her lawyer. He realized that she was contemplating making a switch in not only their relationship, but the financial situation that she wasn't going to pay him off in terms of the will. For a man to whom his wife's money meant so much, Shelley's decision to write Rod out of the will lights the fire that brings his increasingly dangerous behavior to a crescendo. Every penny you're spending right now is her money and her money. That's Shelley. Wait, wait. Wait. Hold on a second. I'd like you to come here. Hold on a second. Come here, please. Yeah. Because you come, haven't come worked out here. five come years in the 12 Ma, years you, you were married, you, you, never, you never worked. He drained the bathtub, he cleaned it with peroxide. With a hand or an arm over your mouth, there ain't gonna be any screaming. On the 30th of December, 2009, Shelley Danishevsky is seen on CCTV returning to her apartment. It was around eight o'clock. She put her children to bed while her estranged husband, Rod, played backgammon in his apartment across the hall. The next day, New Year's Eve 2009, at around seven in the morning, tragedy unfolds in Shelley Danishevsky's Manhattan apartment. 911 gets a call from Rod Kovlin. My daughter just showed up. My little nine-year-old daughter just found her mother in the bathroom dead. The couple's child goes into the bathroom to find her mother deceased in the bathtub. She calls out for her father, Rod. He comes running immediately in. Even as he called the police, Rod Kovlin started spinning a story. He tells the 911 dispatcher that, that she was in, this, in the bathtub, that she m must have had an accident, and that he, he pulls her out of the bathtub. Kovlin explained to them that he had performed CPR, had been performing CPR on his wife's lifeless body. And the 911 dispatcher is, you know, saying, are, are, are you sure, you know, are you sure she's, you know, can you try, are you sure she's dead? No, I'm sure, trust me, she's, she's gone. Local firefighters arrive at the scene, but it's clear there's nothing to be done to save Shelley's life. When the paramedics arrive, it's, it's too late. Rod Kovlin does a good job of convincing NYPD that it's all been a tragic accident. Well, they show up um, and um, the detective, there's a, a New York City lead detective there with the other um, officers and, um, and the paramedics are there and they realize once they get there, Shelley is dead. Shelley's body is wrapped in a comforter on the floor. The bathtub is full of bloody water 
and one of the bathroom cabinets um, is, is hanging off its hinges. Kovlin made sure that he pointed out the cabinet door to the detectives. Rod is saying it looks like she must have tripped and fell because the cabinet and it must have just landed hard in the bathtub. The officers at the scene didn't treat Shelley's death as suspicious. It seems that that whatever story Koblen told the police, they just took it at face value. The detectives, you know, just sort of figure this, this was a horrible accident. Even in cases of apparent accidental death, there are procedures to be followed. So what should have happened? Immediately on arrival, police officers should have sealed off the scene and made note of everything that has taken place or what they can see has taken place in that room. There are some warning signs, some, some sort of red flag alerts here that um, they aren't paying attention to. In fact, the New York lead New York City detective on the scene doesn't even collect any evidence from the scene that day. He doesn't take any notes, uh, despite the fact that there there are some unusual things going on here that don't add up. Retired homicide detective Rod Demery is very clear about what he would have expected from the crime scene investigation. It's a, an examination from top to bottom, everything in the, in the bathroom, everything leading into the bathroom. All the stories, um, even from the nine-year-old, were checked and double-checked and verified against actual evidence. Not only was no evidence collected, police made another blunder. To make matters worse, the scene actually gets scrubbed. The family was Jewish, and for that reason, they allowed a rabbi to come inside the house and thoroughly clean it. At the family's request, police actually allow this man, he's a medical services salesman, he's a self-described rabbi, and he comes in there to clean up Shelley's bodily fluids to prepare for a Jewish funeral. The rabbi was thorough, and he was left alone to get on with his job. The problem is that he's not under any supervision. He's free to do what he wants. He drained the bathtub, he cleaned it with peroxide. Cleans up the entire scene, moves all the bloody clothing into another room. And any potential evidence had been wiped away. The bathroom was clean. Now the only other physical evidence was Shelley's body. Before she was buried, there was no autopsy. The family, for religious reasons, did not want an autopsy. So there was no autopsy and no investigation to suggest that Rod Kovlin could be a suspect in his wife's tragic death. But within five weeks, anomalies began to emerge. First, who had moved Shelley's cell phone? The family came in the following day and found her phone plugged up, her cell phone plugged up next to her bed. And it wasn't there before, so it was kind of strange and it raised a few eyebrows. Secondly, there were unexplained injuries on Shelley's face and body. There were signs of, of possible abuse. There was some bruising on her arms and so forth. Number three, Kovlin's suggestion that perhaps Shelley had slipped onto the bathroom cabinet. If she had fallen maybe and uh, hung onto that cabinet, why didn't they dust the cabinet for prints? Four, Shelley's family discovered the court order that she had taken out against Kovlin. Shelley has a protective order against her husband. He threatened to kill her. Fifth, Rod's story about dragging Shelley from the bath and attempting CPR just didn't stack up. His T-shirt is bone dry. Had he actually performed CPR, he wouldn't be dry. I mean, the story that he was given them um, kind of defies logic. Uh, to have a dry shirt saying that you're providing CPR to someone who's soaking wet or in a bathtub is not likely. None of this is considered at the time. The, the, the cops just determined this was a horrible accident and, and that's it. With the unanswered questions mounting, detectives decided to take another look at Shelley's death. A couple of months later, her body was exhumed. An autopsy is performed and they learn that her hyoid bone is broken. Basically, someone broke her neck. Finally, detectives had something they could go on. This was a homicide, the medical examiner says. And police now are pretty sure who their prime suspect is. Typically, when there's a domestic order or domestic abuse protection order, um, the most likely person that's going to be suspected if that person dies is the person on that protective order. In Shelley's case, that person 
was her husband, Rod Kovlin. But it wasn't until five months after Sherry's death that her apartment was searched for clues or a weapon. They'd be looking for anything that would commit a murder, whether it was a blunt object, shell casings for a firearm, ligatures for strangulation, for manual strangulation, they'd look for, for, for signs of such. The police found nothing. The place had been cleaned up by an unsupervised rabbi. Because of their botched investigation, it's, it's not going to be a quick uh, process to gather enough evidence to charge him. Meanwhile, months turn to years. Rod Kovlin is busy building himself a new life, which continues apparently unencumbered by a low-level police investigation where detectives felt they needed more evidence before making a move against him. During this six years, Rod Kovlin goes on with his life, but he's, he's clearly kind of coming apart at the seams. Family members became concerned enough with Rod's behavior around this time that the couple's two children were sent to live with his parents, David and Carol, in Scarsdale. Rod soon followed and moved in with them, but his motives were far from fatherly. Psychopathy is characterized by um, a lack of empathy, right? So Kovlin wouldn't have known how to act like a father, even if he tried. He might have taken cues from movies, from, you know, uh, television shows, right? But he wouldn't have had that sort of that, that fatherly instinct in him. After the death of his wife, the hopeless backgammon dreamer, the serial womanizer, needed money to pay for his lifestyle. The money left behind by Shelley for their children appeared to be tempting. Rod had made several attempts to access Shelley's money because her will was worth about $5.2 million. Colin would have felt a sense of entitlement, as most psychopaths do, uh, to Shelley's money. She was his wife. You know, he had a right to that. Um, but obviously, at, at, at a much more exacerbated level than would sort of a normal husband. My hunch is that the children were merely instrumental uh, in his greater plan to sink his claws into Shelley and get access to her money. Kovlin's parents, David and Carol, were under no illusion about their son. They made it clear to the children that it was their mother, Shelley, who had been the stable and secure parent in their life, as this recording of a family argument from the time reveals. Your mother worked her ass off for every penny that he's spending. Let me tell you, the Danishevskis are not wrong. They may be wrong about something, not the money. Your Same mother worked here. and worked and worked, and your father sat on He's doing now, he refuses to get a job. He refuses to get a job. Unable to access Shelley's money directly, Coughlin was blamed for what some thought was the siphoning off of his children's inheritance. It basically, Rod is using them as his personal piggy bank. He drains their college funds of $80,000. You steal from your children. You what? stole before. <laughs> you're stealing their college money. They won't be able to get to college by the time you're done with them. And you shouldn't care if they went to college. Why don't you tell her that every penny you're spending right now is her money and money? These screaming rows became more and more frequent in the Scarsdale home. So Rod's now living with his parents, but he's treating them just horribly. You are what you are saying now in front of Okay, we'll ensure that you never see my children again if you continue, okay? You threatened us with no, your children. No, no, I'm not threatening you. Know you. I'm telling you. Over the next few years, Kovlin's behavior became increasingly extreme. Rod is, is just, he's just coming unglued. He started hatching elaborate plots to get the hands on the money from Shelley's will. Now he's got a girlfriend, Deborah Oles, and he's talking to her about, you know, what he could do. Kovlin revealed to Oles that he was perfectly prepared to drag his children into his scheming, just as he had tried to exploit his son as a toddler. Rod has come up with this kidnap plot. If he can get someone to kidnap his then 13-year-old daughter and marry her off to a guy in Mexico, that'll get her out of the way. and he can get access to Shelley's money. Another plan involved faking a murder confession from his own daughter. And he's just, he's so focused on this money. So he's thinking, you know, I could actually frame a for this. So he decides he's gonna frame his daughter for his wife's murder to get the 
the heat off of him. So he goes into the computer and he composes this email, making it look like it's little, his, his 13 year old daughter, writing this email to her legal guardian saying, it was me. Mommy and I had a fight and I got mad at her because these guys she was dating, we had a fight and it was an accident. I didn't mean for her to die. None of the plots came to anything. Meanwhile, Kovlin's parents were growing increasingly worried. They're getting nervous. They're getting really afraid of him. They threw him out of their Scarsdale home and changed the locks as this video shot on Deborah Oles's phone reveals. They changed the lock. They changed the lock. This is up, so my guess is it changed this. I'm a resident. In fear of their own son, David and Carol Kovlin continued to challenge him. You're going to steal okay. from me! Okay. You're a deadbeat! Okay. You're going to steal from me like you steal from your children! Kovlin's response was brutal. He's violent. He, he pushes his mom into a wall, just smashes her head against the wall. He shoves his father down on the ground, winds up injuring his eye. With Shelley out of the way, there was only one thing on Kovlin's mind. How can he get rid of these parents? They're just standing in the way of him getting toward his ex-wife's money. He had already demonstrated he could be violent. How much further would Rod Kovlin be prepared to go? He does whatever he wants. He doesn't really care about real responsibility. And he doesn't care what anybody thinks about him. If I can break her neck, I'll just choke her using one of my martial arts moves. It's like a kid having a temper tantrum because they want a popsicle. Um, it just goes to a higher level. Um, and they're willing to do just about anything. Their mind doesn't conceive or perceive the reality. Rod Kovlin had lived off Shelley's money when she was alive. Now, despite being the prime suspect in her murder, he wanted to get his hands on the millions in her will. In his mind, there was just one thing in his way. His parents, David and Carol, Towards the end, it did seem like he unraveled even further, and he even contemplated killing his own parents. Perhaps he felt like he had put up with Shelley, that he wouldn't have even married her if it wasn't for the money, and now he would stop at nothing, if, even if it means killing off his own kin to get access to her wealth. Taking his cue from murder stories he had seen, Kovlin set to work. He goes online and he starts researching these poisons that he's, he's seen used on shows like Dexter and Breaking Bad, ricin and aconite. He's researching how to use them. At one point, he even thought about or tried to get his daughter to poison one of the grandparents. He's thinking maybe he could even get his daughter to use rat poison to poison his, his parents. As with his earlier plots, Kovlin's plans became more and more extreme. During Hurricane Sandy, he comes up with this idea and he tells Deborah Oles, he wants to burn their house on fire. If he goes to, their, goes to the house, sets the house on fire, grabs the children and traps his parents inside, he could get rid of them that way. His final scheme bordered on the farcical. One plan that Copeland had was to um, dress up as a black man, um, as a door-to-door -door politician or solicitor and um, kill his mother. You know, I can break her neck, I'll just choke her using one of my martial arts moves. And I'll just, I'll disguise myself as a black man, you know, going door to door during the elections. He even visited this shop in Yonkers to assemble a disguise. He actually had his girlfriend drive him to a classroom store where he bought the outfit. He bought some makeup, he bought a black wig, a, a mustache. He was really planning to do this. It's, a, it's sort of like an adult spoiled brat. You know, they get so desperate to get something. They have to have it so badly that they'll go to all sorts of extremes, not even realizing how stupid it is or, or how bizarre it is, they, they, they just have to have it. So it's like a kid having a temper tantrum because they want a popsicle. Um, it just goes to a higher level um, and they're willing to do just about anything. Their mind doesn't conceive or perceive the reality. So there's like nothing that is low enough for Rod Kovlin. There is nothing beyond 
just outrageous when you're going to frame your own children and kill your parents to get at your ex-wife's money. And this just shows you how far this person would go to amass the wealth that he felt like he deserved. Before it's over, he will have come up with four different murder plots against his parents. At the same time as conspiring against his parents, Kovlum was leading a double life. He gets a new job. Uh, he has a fake name. He creates a bogus LinkedIn profile. Using the surname of an old girlfriend, Kovlin called himself Rod Summer and landed a job as a loan collector. Uh, and at his new job, his colleagues say, you know, this guy's a little odd. He seems to be living out of a hotel. He comes in just smelling like booze. And he has these just outrageous temper fits. I mean, he's just furious. By 2014, five years after the death of Shelley Daniszewski, Rod Kovlin's new girlfriend had seen enough of his dark side. Deborah Olds is getting really nervous. She had no idea what this man was capable of. Increasingly frightened of Kovlin, Olers decided to take action. She starts secretly recording their conversations. She collected video evidence of his anger too, recording Kovlin as he struggles to get into his parents' home because they've changed the locks to keep him out. Rod's relationship with Olez collapsed soon after. In 2014, Rod Kovlin and Deborah Oles break up. The writing is on the wall for Rod because he doesn't know it, but Deborah has all these recordings that she secretly made. She will become the state's star witness in the murder trial. Olez took her evidence to the police. It was the big breakthrough that the NYPD needed. In November of 2015, Rod Kovlin is finally arrested and charged with the murder of his wife, Shelley. Kovlin was picked up at the Scarsdale Metro North train station by three NYPD detectives and a representative of the Manhattan District Attorney's Office. It's been six years, six long years for the family, you can imagine. It was two months before he was set to inherit almost one and a half million dollars from his wife's estate. Even now, the horror was far from over for Shelley Danishevsky's family. It would be more than three years before the case came to trial at the Manhattan Supreme Court. At the hearing in March 2019, Shelley Danishevsky's family listened patiently to the evidence. Jurors heard from doctors about Shelley's broken neck. Defense suggests people didn't hear screaming. Really? With a hand or an arm over your mouth, there ain't gonna be any screaming. They saw photographs of the murder scene and heard about Kovlin's martial arts experience. Rod had even demonstrated a chokehold that could be used to break someone's neck whilst awaiting trial. To top it off, prosecutors produced Deborah Olas's secret recordings. The fact is, is that she provided evidence and an, and an insight, an intimate insight into his mind and the, and the desperate measures that he took and the fact that he was actually capable of murder. On Kovlin's side of the courtroom, an unlikely figure, the mother he plotted to kill. Nearly 10 years after Rod Kovlin had reported his dead wife in the bathroom, he was about to discover whether he would be found guilty of the murder of Shelley. I'll show you the first time Guilty. And so say you all. It was motivated by the fact that he was written out of her will. The Supreme Court judge, Ruth Pickholz, handed down the maximum sentence, 25 years to life in prison. Rod Kovlin's in court. He breaks down as the judge reads the sentence. Shelley's family, on the other hand, welcomed the fact that justice had been done. <laughs> Emotions are just, they're all over the place. We never want to send anybody to prison for second degree murder. But in this case, we felt it was absolutely warranted. Shelly was brutally murdered in the prime of her life. And we felt by joining the dots, it was not rocket science. And at the end of the day, the result today spoke for itself. The past few years have been brutally painful and, and gut-wrenching. We've had these feelings of inexorable loss for our beloved children, and her passing has left a gaping loss 
in each of our lives, from which we're still suffering. The freeloading chancer who'd met and married Shelley with an eye to her fortune had been convicted of her murder. Copeland uh, appeared to be just motivated by money. There didn't seem to be anything else, not his children, not his family, but money. I don't think Rod is somebody who actually has normal human emotions. He doesn't have human empathy. He doesn't have emotional bonds. Rod Covelin will spend 25 years to life in prison for killing his wife, Shelley.